I think there's something deeper to look at with that, mm. like in, in how we talk about, especially in, in the realm of psychedelics and how, you know, a lot of this information is tied in with ancient information and like, are we taking, are we taking good care of it, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all, it's all about meaning, right? It's like nothing has meaning unless we treat it carefully. Are we? Yes. Where are we? Here. Why are we here? Not entirely clear. We are misfits thrust into existence by random chance with no hints at all as to how we're supposed to make sense of it all. It's immensely bizarre. Here we are. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Here We Are podcast. Today, very special guest. Haven't had this uh, lady on in a while. Sophia Rocklin is joining me today, who we, uh, let's see, Sophia, two years ago, we, we were <laughs> we were on a tour together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> two, two we years ago. We were on a, sure. <laughs> a, a tour called Head Talks. Let's see, around this time, we would have been traveling through like Charleston and uh, okay. Atlanta and such uh, yep. on on the Head Talks tour, talking about uh, doing some comedy, mixing it with some science, talking about Sophia's book, When Plants Dream. And uh, this is your first appearance on something in like two years, right? Pretty much. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Why why have you not why have you not been uh on anything? What's been your What's the deal? Just, I mean a couple getting, of things. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you're well deal? you're just you're what you're one of the better communicators that I've ever seen and uh and it, it seems like as soon as covid happened you're like I'm not going to do public speaking uh anymore. Yeah. And and now you're you're maybe thinking about getting back into it, which is exciting. So what's the deal? What's going on <laughs> yeah, with this you? This is the exclusive scoop. Um <laughs> Well, uh, you you may or may not remember me casting a hex on the universe saying, "God, I really need a vacation after you and I had been in 10 cities in 10 days." And we did get the vacation of a yeah. lifetime, it seems. Um yeah, we sure did. We sure did. Uh, <laughs> we sure did. But you know, I mean, I think the well, I, I don't know. I guess any context for like listeners, the book that I wrote, "When Plants Dream," um, co-authored yeah. with Daniel Pinchbeck, is all about ayahuasca, Amazonian shamanism, and the global psychedelic renaissance. So. Um, you know, without getting into like too much background or depth, it is an extremely like complex subject, basically. And if you are, you know, following psychedelics at all, it is such a rapidly evolving field that it's hard to kind of keep up with. And I found myself growing quite, you know, disillusioned with the kind of overt influence of you know, monetary gain that didn't really seem to consider some of the subtler but more integral aspects to what I believe is beautiful about psychedelic healing. So I think I just wanted to take a step back and observe. And then there was another part of it, which was that I um, started working with a different, with an organization called the Amazon Emergency Fund. And I went like head on for two years working on emergency aid for indigenous peoples um, impacted by COVID in the Amazon. Um, and it had always been a bit of like a dream or an aspiration of mine to actually apply, you know, reciprocity it, or rather give back in a reciprocal way to indigenous peoples and the beautiful kind of ecological and spiritual wisdom that they share. And so I completely threw myself in headfirst to working kind of behind the scenes. So I've been on thousands of hours of Zoom calls, but none of them published, you know, <laughs> in a public forum. So that's that's like the that's, yeah. the that's the quick and dirty. And then just composting, yeah. you know, I'm like, a, I'm a poetic person. I believe that we have seasons to bloom and seasons to die. And 
you know, sometimes you got to push through. I know, I know you don't believe it that I see you squinting your eyes, but I kind of, I kind of like uh, no, that. Did you, you know? did you just say that? Uh, that's not what I was giggling at. I was giggling specifically. At, did you say you've been composting? Yeah, I've been like, you know, I'm existentially composting, you know? Right. It's like, yeah, you take no, a I moment get it. I enjoy just, the metaphor. Yeah. Take, you keep it. You take it with you somewhere. <laughs> so that's if wonderful. Any of that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. That does make sense. I mean, this is this has been, uh, yeah, it's been it's been an ordeal for a lot of people, and um, and I, obviously, and my life has completely turned upside down <laughs> um, since all of this. So, yeah, I, I get the idea of of uh, going through phases of things. Um, I also found myself a little bit disillusioned with some of the psychedelic stuff since uh, this time and have taken a little bit of a step back. So I don't even I don't even know too much of what to say about anything that's going on. Have you have you found yourself reimmersed back into that scene or are you have you been um, mostly focused on the Amazon um, emergency fund stuff? The scene in air quotes. No, <laughs> I'm out of the scene. Yeah, yeah. Um, but. I think let's just say like very personally, I have been quite immersed in the great scene. Um, I've been working pretty deeply with psychedelics myself for the past two years in like a kind of quiet way. So, and that's been, you know, very interesting, very interesting. Yeah. I like that. You do way more psychedelics than I do, but you you never talk about your experiences. I know people and I blaze just me for that about sometimes. Them endlessly. Well, you know what it is. There's <laughs> I, I I may you know at this point, Shane. I don't know like what I have and haven't shared with you. I'm there's a there's an anthropologist named Mick Tausig, um, and he wrote this very small little booklet called "I Swear I Saw This," and it's kind of like a review of all of his field work that he'd done in the Colombian Amazon. Um, I want to say from the sixties to the eighties and he was working with Yahe and drinking, you know, ayahuasca with those communities there. And he was saying, he was kind of describing the, the subtle anguish he had of like trying to put words to the unlanguageable. And the second that he would mm -hmm. try to language it, it is as if the pages, the, the words ran off the page and in ink and like the visions just disappeared the second that he captured them in words and so i i too am a little bit like i keep i keep my visions close you know sometimes because i i don't fully trust the faculties of language to do them the full multi-dimensional service mm -hmm. that they may deserve but you know i think that that's also something that i could probably lean a little deeper into because i have received positive feedback about sharing my visions <laughs> But, you know, yeah, I mean, I've also it, mentioned it, I go through phases. Yeah, the, the Sequoia, Sorry. no, it's OK, the, the, the Sequoia people in the Ecuadorian Amazon when I was younger, I would go and visit them. <clears throat> They're a small tribe of, you know, about 500 people um, and they have a very, very deep practice with Yahe to uh, ayahuasca, a version of ayahuasca. And they would always recommend to be extremely discerning about when to share visions, you know, because sharing yeah. a vision to one person could actually lead them astray, right? But sometimes a vision is very clear and it's actually, hey, this vision is not for you. You are the recipient of this vision, but your your goal is to bring it out into the larger community, right? Our, our greater family. So it's like not all visions are created equal, I think, too, you know? Yeah, I've learned from blabbing my big mouth um, to <laughs> anyone that will listen that sometimes uh, there, there's something about I enjoy the challenge of trying to articulate those experiences and think through um, potentially why they're happening. I like doing that, but yeah. I also have found that I've run myself into um, trouble in the past by sometimes sometimes when you describe what happened in an experience you uh, th something about doing that uh, can overly commit you to an idea of what happened and a certain interpretation and it kind of locks you in and then um, 
And then I, I'll find that. So then when I, you know, then then when I have a little more time to integrate and, th- and would normally, had I not told anyone, would normally be like, oh, you know what? Maybe I was misremembering that part. And this song that I was listening to is a better explanation for why I had this than what I had, than my first kind of uh, <laughs> premise was. Yeah. But because I had shared it with someone else, now I'm so tied to it. Now it's like, well, okay, what I actually meant was no, but you said was this. this and, I mean, uh, <laughs> we hired you to say yeah. this. And you're like, well, actually, yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, but you know, yeah. Right. I think I, I'm also sorry to interrupt you. I don't I, I don't remember how to do podcasts or conversations. It's like I I do them all the time. I still have no idea how. Perfect. We're just learning as we go. Um, it reminds me, too. It's something that I've been kind of meditating on is like, you know, this this conversation around sacred knowledge and and the occult and secret knowledge and some people will say like oh come on we live in the 21st century it's just you know you go on the internet and you publish everything and everything is free and it's all open and a couple of times i've noticed in my in my life and in my path you know i'll i'll be told something that's really special you know like some some told about a old tradition or old ritual that some people in the mountains used to perform at this certain solstice at this certain, you know, and just the, and to me, the whole thing was just like, wow, this is the most beautiful, sacred little package of information I could receive. Thank you. Right. And then I go to someone else and I'm like, Hey dude, did you know blah, blah, blah. And they're like, Oh yeah, that's cool. Can you pass me whatever, you know, and they just don't listen at all. And they kind of throw that away. And Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that that that's that's something. I think there's something deeper to look at with that, like in, in how we talk about, mm. especially in in the realm of psychedelics and how you know a lot of this information is tied in with ancient information and like are we taking are we taking good care of it, right? Because at the end of the day, it's all it's all about meaning, right? It's like nothing has meaning unless we treat it carefully, right? I think. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I it's I mean, I think there's uh yeah, I I have I have no clear I've never developed a clear answer. Sometimes I put things out there and it's also the the way in which people receive the things that everyone not only do we all kind of remember things the way that we in our own little versions, but people hear the things that you'll tell them in their own way. So I'll present a story and I'll be like, here's what I think is going on. And but people just hear what they want to hear in the story. And that leads to a lot of uh, misunderstanding and that I don't know. And then I, I get people messaging me um do you constantly know? anytime I put something out there and and sometimes that gets that gets a little bit old I I wish I wish that when I did a you know I wish that when I did a episode about um cicadas or something people were messaging me like oh I was thinking of this other idea about cicadas could you follow up and here I have these and other insect questions instead i do like one psychedelic episode a year and i'm constantly inundated with where can i score dmt in cincinnati are you on signal i have a question to ask you (laughs) (laughs) and then i'm dealing with various people's mental (sighs) health issues and everything else it's uh it's messy not that it's not that i'm uh, it's just an interesting it's an interesting space. There's there's no clear guidance on uh, best practices yeah. um, in in our in our modern world, and I I think that that's really interesting about what your experience was and what you were able to explore was because you you got to be immersed within traditions that have lasted for a very long time, and and you know whether uh whether it's whether it's scientific method or cultural transmissions or anything else it's still it's a it's a way of developing a process and gaining understanding even if that's through trial and error or whatever over time and that uh 
it, it just seems like a, a much better perspective than, um, for example, just listening to me talk about the time that I <laughs> went to someone's house and blasted a bunch of DMT into my brain while listening to Spongle and came up with some wacky ideas of what it all meant. <laughs> you know? Well, no, I mean, it's, it's all yes and no, basically, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like we, we, yeah. I, um, I, by the way, for the listener, if, if our conversation seems a little stunted here and there, it's because I can't see Sophia you still can't right see now. Me. Yeah. I, I still can't see you. You, the listener, get to get to see Sophia. The the recording is such that it lowers the quality, and once in a while, this happens. And so, I'm just imagining <laughs> what your body you language is like and trying to respond. <laughs> Okay, good luck. This is um, a nice altered state for you there. <laughs> but so, so, but this is sort of the gist of some of the uh, of of your book, When Plants Dream, is describing kind of what what some of the traditional use is, and then what is happening with modern interest and in, and in what that what impact that potentially is having. Correct? Yeah, definitely. The book. Very, you know, the the book One Plant's Dream was an attempt to kind of create a, a capture in time of this phenomenon of ayahuasca, the psychoactive tea um, from the Amazon basin as it travels across the world. And Shane, you and I have gone around the country talking, you know, extensively about this. Um, but I think, you know, to me, what's been so interesting about Ayahuasca is that it's such a multifaceted thing, right? You can look at the commodification of ayahuasca. You can look at the chemistry of ayahuasca. You could look at the subculture or now the mainstream cultures kind of congregating around ayahuasca. And I think for a little bit of like context, you know, sometimes people talk about ayahuasca like it's this fringe, you know, beverage. It's made with two plants from the Amazon Banisteriopsis copy and usually Cicotria viridis. Um, B copy has a monoamine oxidase inhibitor and P viridis has um, DMT in it. So it's kind of like a, you could say it's like a full body DMT experience. That is the most simplified version I've ever given of it before. Um, but, you know, if you think about different psychoactive plants throughout the course of human history, you start to realize that, oh, hey, this may like actually change something significant in our culture, right? Look at coffee culture. Um, coffee houses were some of the first places where people would go to congregate. And in this kind of caffeinated, super stoked state of consciousness, people would go and share scientific ideas, right? They would philosophize. They would actually go ahead and start to like think many steps into the future about systems and finance and all these different things. And then you think about you know, cocaine, you think about the financial system and you know, starting in Wall Street and imagine, you know, Wall Street without cocaine in the 1970s. Imagine, mm -hmm. you know, any, I mean, you, if you, you, it doesn't take too much to just look at how psychoactive plants shape our cultures and our societies. And so I think I really wanted to take right. a more serious look at ayahuasca and put it into, con into context and say, hey, why are people putting themselves through what we call this ordeal medicine? So it's generally like a fairly unpleasant experience. It's this very strong purgative, um, which ultimately actually plays like a fundamental role in the healing process. Um, you know, actually having the ability to purge is quite like, you know, quite, quite a relief, quite beautiful. Um, why would people put themselves through that? And so that's kind of what the book was looking at. And that is like a ultra simplified version of it. But I think, you know, I think just even talking to you like now as Omicron and this kind of what I feel is like a darker shade is kind of being cast over civilization. I really appreciate the ability to look at history, you know, and, and especially mm -hmm. look at different substances and species and viruses and start to understand a little bit better about how, you know, we can like take a step back from this hyper anthropocentric worldview and be like, oh, there are actually like very powerful factors at play that shape our story and our consciousness. And this moment is obviously no exception to that, you know, so. 
Viruses have been around for uh, over four billion years. That's so. Um, the the first brain, uh, very very simple central nervous system, evolved about eight hundred thousand years ago. Um, so like about four billion years after life started, and I feel like it's still got some catching up to do, perhaps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> but, like we're still but, just sponges. Uh, yeah, but but yeah. So so it's. I think understanding uh, history and these various interactions is uh, is incredibly important, and 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 understanding how how we came to know and some of the mistakes that were made along the way, and it, you know, it's when you hear you mention this this these these two different um ingredients in ayahuasca that are combined and usually this is thought of as like how in the world did they think to combine this with this thing was it this destiny was it this magical thing that happened and um first off we can we can uh we 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 all, we all have different ideas of what magical means but um anyway the uh, the point is, is that there there's some really interesting things that you learned as an anthropologist about some of the ways in which indigenous people go about investigating um, new plants. Some of the things that seem counterintuitive to us, such as purging for if you're in an area that has a high parasitic load and and perhaps a lot of uh worms and meat and stuff right. like that 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 purging is something that is actually uh beneficial something that seems really bizarre to any american um brought up in our modern uh very sanitized culture but makes a lot more sense when you think about things from uh evolutionary time 100 percent, yeah stefan Bayer, who wrote this amazing book it's called singing to the plants was I think one of the first to postulate, you know, that um, Amazonian peoples may not have just like spontaneously found these two plants, but they actually were finding a better way to purge, to adapt to a certain diet that they were having. So mm -hmm. can you imagine how many <laughs> hundreds, you know, thousands of years it took of them to find that perfect formula? And even then that was probably discarded as a formula with side effects that were a little too intense for just a little <laughs> squeaky cleaning, you know? Um but yeah. yeah, it's that book is fantastic, by the way. I also highly recommend that book to anyone who's interested in studying. What's the name of it again? It's called Singing to the Plants. Um, and uh. it's about mestizo, so kind of mixed race shamanism in the Amazon basin. It's a, it's a phenomenally well-researched and poetic book. Um, but yeah, right. So that is one of the ways, that is one of the things that people, you know, continuously wonder about. But then again, I mean, right, there are other people throughout the Amazon basin, they all lay claim to being, you know, the descendants of the original peoples that received the special formula for ayahuasca. So everyone is fighting for the IP on that, but <laughs> not mm -hmm. much is different at the end of the day. Um, uh, yeah. Right. And, and how did, uh, how did you find yourself in uh, Peru in the first place? Oh my God. 6,000 years ago. <laughs> um, well, I, I didn't start going to the Amazon in Peru. The first time I went to the Amazon, I went to the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, and I was like 19 and I went there. Basic. I had a friend of a friend give me a piece of paper with an email and he's like, hey, you know, like this is, I, I had met this community called the Sequoia and I knew this ethnobotanist, Jonathan Miller Weisberger, who worked very closely with them for decades on land rights and different things in the area. And a friend of Jonathan's gave me a, a name of somebody that I could call if I ended up in Ecuador and I just did it. And then I got in a beat up van and then I drove eight hours into the forest <laughs> And, uh, which, you know, looking back may not have been the smartest thing to do, but I was probably the best decision of my life, ironically. So go figure. 
Um, and I spent, you know, a lot of time periodically visiting this community, this very small community and learning, you know, about their traditional ways. And I think I, what really brought me to it was, you know, I'd, I'd always been, I grew up in New York city and I feel like a bit of an orphan to culture that goes beyond capitalism. Right. I felt I'm like an only child and I've wanted to, I've always had this fascinating kind of draw towards religion probably isn't the right word, but organized bodies of people that are coming together and sharing a certain set of values that are maybe transcendental um, and a set of practices that help kind of orient oneself in the world and, you know, in relation to other beings. And so mm. I, you know, had always been interested in that. I studied anthropology in undergrad. And from there on, it was always kind of a journey to see what traditional peoples were still, you know, what knowledge that had been built in situ. So like in the space had was still preserved in a world that is so kind of vociferously attempting to tear it out of its place, right? Because worldviews are shaped very much by our environments, especially for indigenous peoples, you know, for traditional peoples. Like, you know, there's something very interesting in the field called sensory ecology or, you know, different geographies are, are understood like, for example, you know, somebody who lives in the plains, like a, a plains indigenous person who can see long and far will probably have a more acute sense of vision, right? But they won't rely so heavily on their faculties of hearing or taste. Whereas somebody in the Amazon basin who only has a visual of, let's say, you know, a couple meters ahead is very likely to have an extremely sophisticated sense of smell and other things, right? So that's that's something that to me has always been like, wow, so beautiful, you know? And it's it's every little thing from the trees to the plants, to the winds, to the stars, and it's all based in place. And that's when you really start to have a, a knowledge really of like the tragedy of what it is to displace traditional peoples from their homes. And I think that I I, I got tipped onto that kind of early and from then on have been totally committed to supporting people in really maintaining a, a dignified relationship with their land if they feel like that's what they're meant to be doing. But this gets us into uh, what I think is a, is a really important aspect about what you uh, do. I remember when we met uh, summer of 2019, we were both giving talks at a place and I was like, you're going to be talking with people at the UN uh, eventually uh, over this stuff. And then two years later, you were. I called it. I was right. <laughs> yeah, you kind of did. How about that? How about that? Shucks. <laughs> um, so, so. Something uh, in the water. So. Uh, Talk, talk about some of the, some of your work. So uh, going back to, uh, I, I think it's a good place to set up. You uh, tell the story of, of kind of going to the Amazon and seeing uh, a lot of the destruction um, happening there and kind of how that shaped some of your lens. I'm smiling because it's like, sure, no problem. <laughs> it's like, ooh, it's heavy. Um, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, from, from the first person me i'm the first person um the first time i went out there <clears throat> you know even just driving into this community it's like an eight hour 10 15 hour drive the first thing are the highways the actual roads that you're on you see these huge snaking pathways that are like culturally understood to be quite cancerous in some ways to you know forests the second that highways come through that just totally opens up interest in territories that are often not, you know, demarcated in any way um, or recognized as indigenous land. So people just go ahead. It's like a frenzy for developing agribusiness or anything else. But anyway, first person. Um, yeah, the first time I drove through the forest, it was like the most horrifying thing I'd ever seen. You know, it's just hours and hours and hours and hours of driving on these brand new asphalt highways with, you know, big old growth trees, just kind of haphazardly strung onto the back of trucks. And then you keep going and it's just 
palm oil plantations as far as the eye can see. Um, and palm oil plantations kind of look like a forest, but not really. There are these trees that are grown in these short stubby rows um, and the the fruits or the kernels are eventually used as oil for food or fuel or, you know, feed for different animals. Um, and then you go farther and then you have oil kind of extraction operation. So it's just kind of like one thing after another without any kind of redeeming cultural thing to make it look nice. And then you might go to a small village where the main industries are, you know, apart from oil is like, you know, prostitution or things like that. So it, I, I can't really, unfortunately, paint a really beautiful picture of what it's like in some regions of the Amazon. That's probably, that's what it looks like when it starts to get heavier. You know, mm -hmm. um, a lot well, of it's people incredibly valuable resource for uh, for a lot of people, depending on their absolutely. intent. Absolutely, a hundred percent, right? It's like a very complex situation because I think that, of course, oil and palm oil and these things bring livelihood to so many people. So, you know, it's it's. I mean, it's crazy. I think a huge percent of the world, in one way or another, relies their income or their livelihood relies in some way or another on resources from you know the Amazon. So this it's not an issue that's going to be resolved overnight. Um, and you know I think it's also a mythology to believe that all uh, traditional or indigenous peoples want to continue to live in the way that they have. A lot of them actually do have an appetite for you know Nikes and chocolate and you know the nightlife or may have other aspirations like going and getting a college university like a university degree you know or joining going to a city and all of that is great you know but that all of those things factor into a really rapidly transforming um, landscape out in the forest over there but you know then you also do see and I think this is one of the things that's kind of interesting about ayahuasca and actually a global interest in psychoactive plants and not only psychoactive plants, but just traditional knowledge from the Amazon is that it provides a source of income for people that does not necessarily rely on, let's say a worse type of extractivism, right? It's not, you know, otherwise your options are fairly limited in terms of eking a living um, and participating in a capitalist kind of global economy. Um, but yeah, so that's like a, <laughs> that's just like a very short snippet into what some of the destruction might look like. And then there's deforestation, of course, which is like a whole other thing, which is just, you know, raised down to the ground, ashy, dry, sav burnt savanna like territory in the forest. So And even in terms of uh, uh, even in terms of um uh ayahuasca, there's a lot of uh irresponsible kind of harvesting of ayahuasca from well-meaning people that are like, I'm going to go down and uh, gain enlightenment and start helping the uh, uh, nature and, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> and mm -hmm. the planet mm -hmm. and, and in doing so end up uh, causing more harm than they realize. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that wouldn't be the first story of, you know, pay Coyote also has a huge issue with that as well, over harvesting, right? Ayahuasca, the vine itself, the guy I was talking about earlier, uh, Banisteriopsis copy, it, you know, it's a fast growing vine, but it requires pretty specific conditions. And if it is in a good condition, it will thrive. It will just freaking take over the whole forest. But if it's not, it's going to be a little finicky and it's not going to want to grow there. So the actual bee copy to people say that the sweet spot for harvesting it is five to 10 years. Um, and you can imagine that we are absolutely harvesting it much faster than it is having time to grow back. Um, mm -hmm. And at the time, you know, at the, at the, at the present moment, we are overwhelmingly taking wild ayahuasca and not farmed ayahuasca. And so part of what I was working on when I lived in the Peruvian Amazon was an initiative to actually start sustainable ayahuasca harvesting um, at the Temple of the Way of Light, which is a very well-known ayahuasca retreat center in Iquitos. And that was really beautiful. You know, I think that that's a really important step to rectifying some really, really ugly behavior that, you know, just comes with being in a 
in a kind of consumerist society is really actually taking time to focus on what we're giving back. And that's also the issue with, you know, tourism too, is that you have, you know, a sip of this, you know, whatever you have this cigar or this candy or whatever. And, you know, that done millions of times over is going to be kind of destructive for an environment. So how can we actually look to, to building a more sustainable model that, um, you know, and not only sustainable, but regenerative, right. A model that also provides, livelihoods and reforests and actually brings beauty to the forest in a way that, you know, we haven't seen. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love, this is the importance of psychedelic integration to me is because I've, I, what I've loved in psychedelics, first off for all the saying that I blab about them, I didn't do that for a long time. I was in this, the, I wouldn't say the closet with my psychedelic use, but I certainly wasn't doing shows all about them. Uh, I was using psychedelics by myself, kind of doing my own investigations and then uh, and asking people outside of the field what they thought of various perception things and, that I was thinking of. And I, I thought psychedelics are such an interesting way to do science themed shows talking about perception and and consciousness in ways that people actually want to hear because my goodness getting people to care about this boring yeah. science stuff is yeah. such a challenge and you've you've taken sorry yeah no, i was gonna say psychedelics are like the gateway drug to science you know <laughs> For for me, they are, and, and then for others, for they can also too. be a gateway drug to more empathy for for more understanding of environmental issues. And the more I got immersed in the psychedelic community, and I think I probably fell for this early on when I was younger and earlier in my use. When you have like less use, th those those first experiences are so profound that it's like this is everything <laughs> and and the psychedelics become the end goal for a lot of people like right. if we just get everyone doing psychedelics that will just solve everything everything else is like meh whatever we just need everyone doing psychedelics and then all all the rest of our problems will fall into place yeah. whereas uh whereas you've used these experiences that you have to take on really serious work and terms of okay what can you actually do to help indigenous people what can you do to raise awareness of the actual environmental issues using psychedelics as a means to an end mm. as a tool to uh to problem solve and and raise awareness rather than an end in and of itself yeah yeah it's, I'm sure you've heard the Alan Watts quote. If you hear the phone pick, how's it going? If you hear the phone ringing, pick it up and then hang it up when you receive the message, something like that, right? Like a lot of us yeah. just hang out listening to the message over and over again. Like, wow, that sounds so good, you know, but it's actually like, okay, like how are you going to apply this information? And I mean, I learned that through trial and error, you know, because I got started with psychedelics for better, for worse, like quite, quite young, you know? And I think that I realized like, I gotta go somewhere with this because it's just going to be like a wacky carnival ride if I don't, you know? And I think really yeah. like doing psychedelics at a young age really pushed me on a, on a mission to like figure out what am I doing? You know, like, what am I, what am I really doing? You know, I, mm -hmm. at some point I just got this in, and I'm still kind of that way. I just had this insatiable appetite to understand like, wh what are you actually doing you know you're going to work but what are you really doing you're like drinking the water but what are you really doing if you know what i mean just dropping into like a deeper awareness about thing and then that from like a meditative perspective right like and i think that at that point i the real question that started to come up for me was like integrity right how could i possibly go and work at a place that I didn't feel was in integrity with my values. And I think that that's some of the beauty and some of the pain that comes with doing psychedelics. It's like you start to see through the mirage of some of the things and it can create mirages of its own too, but you start to see that it's like you kind of, you, you peer through the veil. And once you peer through the veil, it's much harder to kind of comprom kind of meet halfway you know you, there's no bullshitting anymore you yeah can, you got to get real so 
Yeah, good luck with those Wall Street dreams after you've had enough <laughs> psychedelic <Right>? experience. <laughs> I mean, hey, it works out very well me. for some very wealthy individuals yeah. because it's not to say, you know, and also I think that it, I, we should, I think, duly instead of insert a PSA here that you and I both know that psychedelics are no panacea, right? They, right. in some cases, absolutely inflate people's you know megalomania egos whatever you know what i mean it's like you and i have both seen very interesting characters who come only so far into the psychedelic experience as losing their ego right and they're like "Ooh, you know what i'm not gonna go there (laughs) you're just kind of hanging out right on the edge there and things can get really really freaky and weird there and i'm not saying that i haven't got like i think you and i've probably both gone there to a certain extent you know but so, I certainly have. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just makes two of us, you know. So it's, it's good to keep it in check, but also, and you know, for for context too, like studying traditional uses of ayahuasca. I mean, by no means has ayahuasca always been used for love and light. It's been used in nefarious ass stuff, like you know, sorcery, finding the location of cheating lovers, and just like the worst of the worst, you know, casting spells on people. And you know, I mean, who who knows what's happened with it? It's a very strong psychoactive potion. So again, it's like beating a dead horse, but it's just intention, intention, intention. What are you really doing? You know? Yeah. 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 There's there's certainly a difference between kind of seeing a new perspective and validating pre existing perspectives. And psychedelics have <laughs> uh, well a great put, propensity yeah. of doing both. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Know? I got and, it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, and it and sometimes you see a new perspective, and confirmation bias takes over, and you and you get too sucked into that uh, hole as well. And uh, so, not just intention, but integration is so important. And it, it's you know, there's there there's different kind of drivers going on in the in the mind between uh, intention and integration, and uh, the difference between um, kind of drive and or like a sense of purpose and actually doing is it's like you know you know when you're uh you know when you walk in a room and you to like you're like your purpose goes like you know what i'm gonna go and grab that thing from my room and then you go into the room and you're like <laughs> why am i here <laughs> do i why know did that i yeah. walk to this <laughs> room what am what am i looking for yeah i walked all the way here i'm looking for something there, there's like there's this decoupling between between um you know purpose and and drive and actually doing and a lot of times they're working in unison and i i i think that a, a lot of times our conscious and subconscious are trying to c- communicate and mutually beneficial ways and get on the same page and i think sometimes there's just hiccups with, with within yeah. that and and if you you know taking that silly example and expanding it to you know a, a greater sense of purpose we ha- will also have a big idea and a psychedelic experience or any experience so you travel anywhere and have this life changing you're going to change everything and and maybe you start down a path and then you go down a path you're like what wait why did i why am i here what did i walk down this path for yeah so yeah. it's it's just a it's just a messy sort of experience being being human this and, is like a little too close uh, to home right now i'm like <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. because i mean i not to get into like the me too or i'm anything. a stand-up comedian yeah, you know, like, i don't like, know if i am a stand-up comedian anymore but it like certainly was this comedian passionate now. dream that i had <laughs> yeah 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 i mean yeah definitely i you know i've i've before we got on this podcast i kind of wanted to think about like what you know, what tools, if any, I think the psychedelic experience could offer in terms of understanding like the time we're in, (laughs) you know, like Mm -hmm. how does it, and, and, you know, in some ways right now feels like a really, like that kind of really awkward part in the trip where like, Ooh, like, am I hot or am I cold? Or you're like, I need a blanket. And you're like, Oh no, there's a new person in the room. Like get them away. You know, like just when everything starts to feel a little like hairy, 
But just yeah. returning to, you know, those very simple steps, just like breath and anchoring to your intention and just like, okay, like the blizzard is getting intense, but just if there's anything we've learned, it's like those simple things. And there's no reason why those same principles don't apply, you know, me thinks. Yeah, it, 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 it felt like, uh, it felt like a mushroom trip early on the last, the last time you and I did something virtually together, uh, was we were trying to do virtual head talks things at the beginning. That was like, like a great, was trying to that was a out- great part of the trip though. I loved that. That was a wonderful part of the trip. The exciting part when it was like, whoa, everything's so much different and Virtual. interesting and <laughs> nature's coming back. And I'm yeah. seeing all the and now it's just like a, it's just like a <laughs> real long acid trip where like the cops like, show up. Mom, and mom, you're like, this wasn't supposed to be 72 hours long. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah coming along with like uh, all sorts of paranoia and no one knows what to listen it's like well i don't know do we drink our own pee is that what we do <laughs> now which doing is now? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> which please don't okay, that's okay. a real thing people are doing and i know someone that i i found out someone was doing that a friend of mine told me one of their friends was doing that for uh for a uh, homeopathic solution that to is things not the um, first time that's like a real thing in ayurvedic medicine yeah. they that's a, that's the thing i know it sounds crazy i myself have not dabbled but i would i would you know i'm not against it actually okay well that's a, that's a we tried and true method controlled- <laughs> We need to do the control and experimental condition and everything. I I feel like and do the make sure that there's placebo urine that everything. What, <laughs> everything what would the placebo? Just like little yellow. Yeah, well, jobs. it needs to look, smell, and taste exactly like urine, so All you right, can't get differentiate cracking. it. But it can't be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, the the point is, is that it's uh, that this is uh, this this whole experience is is uh very. There's a lot of of, there's a lot of loss of control and predictability and a lot of uncertainty and uh certainly trips can be a lot like that especially first trips and this is all our first pandemic so uh, <laughs> yeah, or baby's most of first ours anyway pandemic <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i mean so. you know not to get too meta or anything but i can don't you isn't there a part of you that like feels like we've been here before? You know, I, <laughs> You're like, do you no. mean, <laughs> do, well, I don't know how to answer that. So are, are, are you asking me like, uh, like we're in a simulation and all of this keeps on happening again and again, or Not are you quite. saying Not like hu- humans have gone through these cyclical yeah, kind of I think phrase. I think what I'm pointing to. I spent a lot to, of time reading pandemic history during right. this, and yeah, and it's yes, Has yes, that yes, yes. You cognitively kind of grapple I, to cope with you know life a little bit. It sometimes made me more mad, but it's also <laughs> it made me it's more also mad. like it's so fascinating, and yeah, there's a lot of the same. Uh, the the same human response over yeah. and it's so fun because anyone can get it anyone anyone can anyone can read a a book uh i think there's a good one the pandemic century anyone can read a book about pandemic history and really understand it whereas understanding the nitty-gritty of like microbiology and stuff is a nightmare it's like oh my god but just to listen to a little bit of history yeah i think that i think that we've been here before if that's what you're asking me yeah Yeah, i think i think these things happen yeah like maybe not in this we, we live in a very fast time where like we we are so used to now if we have a slight connection issue or something, it's like, how, no. how have they figured this out? How is it not working exactly the way that I want it to when I want it to? Like, if I'm you a have paying to, customer if here. You, 
if you have to wait for something to download or anything, it's like, how could this possibly take so long? How could my GPS system take 20 seconds to recalibrate when I've made a wrong turn and it's infuriating? Whereas it, you know, the, the first inoculation, which you might be interested in, actually came from indigenous people. Um, uh, 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 Lady Montague um, d- discovered it um, from indigenous people uh, that would uh, that would in in the fall season take pus out of people that had had pox and then and then you'd cut people's veins open and put a little bit in there to uh, inoculate everyone. That's how wow. they discovered the first smallpox vaccine. Brilliant. It was an indigenous practice and it took a really long time to adopt because it was an indigenous practice. And people in Europe were like, we're not uh, these uh, these dirty, different skinned, ethnic, you know, indigenous, yeah, words, yeah. primitive people, you know, the whole rap. Uh, yeah. And and it was also a female that brought that information to them and ladies can't do science and that whole thing. Anyhow, it took like 70 years from people from the time that there was a solution available to people till the time that it was actually a adop- the the story's more complex than that but sure. it took 70 years for people to be like okay i'm i'm down for this so i have to remind myself of that when i'm like why why wouldn't someone just get the vaccine like whatever um but yeah, we've we've been here. We've been here before in a lot of ways. I feel like I'm I feel like I'm just venting right now and getting off topic because I want to know about you. We haven't caught up in so long. Um I I want to uh I I want to get into what I think is really important stuff about uh, what you do, even if listeners are like, I want to hear about her ayahuasca experience. Uh, more, more pus inoculations, please. Uh, more pus inoculation. Yeah, they they're hungry for they go pus crazy inoculations. For them. <laughs> um, it, so so talk about because I want to I want to hear your uh, because you were already doing a lot of nonprofit stuff. Uh, when you and I met and, and doing it more and more and when we were it was making touring really complicated because of how how much nonprofit stuff you were doing and then uh, yeah. and you've really um, uh, taken things up a notch through in these last two years. So yeah. can you can you talk about some of that and and I, I just want people to uh, know about all this important work and um, sure a bit more yeah. I'll do my best to make it as interesting as pus, but I can't make any promises. Um, no, just kidding. So, yeah. So, I, well, it is actually a very interesting frontier. And by a frontier, I mean, um, you know, indigenous peoples working together with nonprofit organizations in a way that's run by indigenous people. So, like a little background, um, pandemic started Let's say like it really got active. The organization that I work for, the Amazon Emergency Fund, um, is a basically it's a coalition. It's a collaboration of um, over 40 nonprofit organizations that work in different human rights and environmental sectors. And then dozens of indigenous and grassroots organizations throughout nine countries in the Amazon basin. So like. For your listeners, the Amazon Basin is, this is interesting because <laughs> the Amazon is the world's- All of this stuff is interesting. It's, yeah, but I mean, you know, sometimes it's like, I really, I just don't know how to drill it into people's heads, how important ecologically and existentially magnificent the Amazon rainforest is. You know, it's like, you kind of have to go there to understand like, oh my gosh, like this is- the most gorgeous proliferation of diversity and life there is, you know, and there's something you physiologically have an ex- and spiritually have an experience when you go to the jungle, you're like, Oh my gosh, like I am such a little, you know, thing. And you just have to bow down to the majesty and the beauty of nature. Anyway. So Amazon world's most biodiverse place um, in one given river in an Amazon will have more fish species than in all of like North America combined. And 
one out of every 10 birds in the world is from the Amazon. One out of every four plants in the world is from the Amazon. It is just like the big mama of planet Earth. And without getting too deep into, you know, any of the environmental factors, it's also home to about 1 million indigenous people. Um, that number is like a very, unfortunately, vague estimation due to a lack of data in the area. Um, and it's estimated that those indigenous people speak approximately 400 languages. So 400 distinct ethnic groups. And when you say a distinct ethnic group, that means that they may have different understandings of you know, astrology, time, um, dietary rituals and rites of passage, um, traditional ecological knowledge, healing practices, etc. So just the human bodies of knowledge and wisdom that has been developed in partnership with the forest or has emerged from the forest is like just cultural I don't like the word patrimony, but it, it's like a heritage. It's like, it, it's just the, it's one of the most precious things that we have as human beings, as a human species, I think. Um, and so Amazon, so to backtrack, Amazon Emergency Fund, COVID comes and indigenous peoples are unfortunately for, you know, various different reasons, they have lowered immunity to different diseases. They have far lower access to hospital care, not only like just by geographic distribution, but also they often are confronted with issues of discrimination, um, financial and racial and so on. Um, and, you know, th a lot of indigenous peoples are slowly being integrated into a market economy, meaning that they are weaning away from traditional survival, let's say hunter gatherer lifestyles. So, Stops in supply chains that started with COVID dealt a fatal blow to many, many of these communities who are the guardians of the world's most precious forest. And one of our last keys really to actually combating the greater issue of climate change and so on. Um, mm. And so this coalition came together and it's that what I was so proud to really like participate in was that this was an unprecedented move where all of these NGOs and different organizations who are working separately up until this point, for the most part, came together and they said, we need to pool together resources to combat this situation because it is not going to look good if we don't actually come together. And so in partnership with all of these different organizations, we raised $3 million pretty swiftly. And I have been in charge for the last two years of working with a council of different indigenous leaders from nine countries. So Brazil, Bolivia, Venezuela, French Guiana, Guiana, Suriname, uh, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia. Um, and hearing from them, from those leaders, what's happening and what they need. And so we've brought emergency transportation. So, you know, river boats that go in and out of hospitals, COVID testing and kits. In the earlier days, we did personal protective equipment. Um, a lot of what we were working with is bringing oxygen to communities who had serious shortages when they were in, you know, in dire straits. Um, and then a lot of the initiatives that we were supporting later on looked a lot more like regenerating, you know, uh, food sovereignty and bringing fishing equipment and, you know, different hunting tools and different gardening tools and things to help communities really regain their footing in an increasingly kind of rocky world. Um, and so that's what I've been doing for two years. And right now we're on a bit of a we're on a bit of a administrative pause as we're just focusing more on actually like fi finishing the programs, which are going to be going on for approximately another year. So it's been, it's been real. Mm. It's been really real. Wow. Yeah. There's something amazing about being on a zoom call with like, you know, 40 leaders from nine countries around the world. And sometimes you hear like macaws squawking in the back or moto taxis or, you know, machetes chopping. And it's just like, whoa, you know, and it's, it's really special. I feel really honored to have served people in that way. You know, that's amazing. Can you talk a little bit about, um, basically where I'm going to be going is, uh, what, what humanity or earth or the Amazon loses as they lose indigenous people. And uh, to set that up, I was wondering if you could kind of talk about um, 
indigenous people's role within the environment, within a sort of, uh, a, you know, where where I'm f- from and where I'm raised, humans don't have like that as much of a symbiotic <laughs> relationship with with nature as the things that have happened really quick and we're kind of uh decoupled from that um from that process but i i know that um i know that indigenous people in the amazon do uh, a lot of stuff in terms of preserving soil and other things like that 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 they're uh actually a, a really necessary Part up for anyone that listen that's listening. That's just like, why don't we just stick them all in the city? They'll love it. City okay. life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so yeah, approaching how, how, what what angle to bite this from? So like, let's say a, a, a useful statistic just to understand like the global relevance of it is you know, indigenous peoples. Let's say the World Bank published some data a long time ago that said that indigenous peoples um, are approximately, they, they say they occupy about 80% of the world's like land, like in natural forests, basically. They play a huge role in protecting their traditional landscapes. And the reason why they do that oftentimes is because they derive food, medicine, shelter, pretty much everything from the forest. So it is in their entire interest to have the forest. The forest is their pharmacy. It's their, you know, carpentry shop. It's their playground. It's all of it, right? The forest is everything. They are the forest. Um, There's also research published that, you know, that points to indigenous people's lands quantitatively capturing more carbon. Um, so the, you know, there's, there's it, the data shows that it, it is in the world's interests to keep indigenous peoples in their lands and to not basically kick them off for, you know, short term, uh, profit and gain. Um, mm-hmm. would you mind kind of circling back the, I guess the question was kind of like, what is the culture, like, what is the importance or the significance of kind of supporting? Yeah. Them? Let's circle back. Yeah. Just, yeah. Sort of reinstate the just, just like, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, I, I guess just the the conversation that I'd like to have is, yeah. um, it, it is, I, I think that. Let me rephrase it this way. I, I would say that a lot of people, if I went out and about and talked to just an average person on the street about indigenous cultures, they would view them as i i don't mean to be so pejorative no, when i say that it. but just, just uh, but like like a thing that's like being preserved i i don't i don't mean to straw man a thing but yeah, it's no, just like you. hey it's this thing that's being preserved that's like you know we don't like the polar bears to go extinct we don't really need the polar bears around but uh, you know we're we're just preserving them and preserving this area like this zoo of indigenous people but there's there there are real stakes that impact um the the, the world the global population there mm-hmm. uh, full cultures we we lose languages we mm-hmm. we lose uh environmental processes and protections mm-hmm. that sort of thing mm-hmm. i th- mm-hmm. that's that's what i'm trying to set mm-hmm. up yeah so yeah one really interesting thing about an organization that i work with it's called the the rainforest foundation so aef the project that i currently work for is nested within it's fiscally sponsored by the rainforest foundation and so Rainforest Foundation's approach to this issue has always been supporting indigenous rights is the key to preserving rainforests. Rainforests being important because without them, our entire global ecosystem pretty rapidly collapses. Rainforests are responsible. The actual, the, the, so a really good way to like talk about the importance of the Amazon for me is to think about the river, right? The Amazon River. It's 4,000 it's about 4,200 miles long. So the United States, for comparison, across is about 2,800 miles. So Amazon rainforest, 4,200 miles long with 50,000 miles of tributaries of like winding rivers that go through it. And it provides a 20, a 20% of the world's fresh water is said to be 
kind of in the Amazon where it's in conversation with the trees and what they call the rivers in the sky. So these basically bodies of water that move through the, the atmosphere and the rains that then go feed back into the river and so on. And so it's this really beautiful kind of process of nourishing the world in a global kind of sense, right? If you look at the world without, you know, maps or anything, you're going to, you're going to see, you're going to see like how that plays a role in the health of everybody and everything. And so, yeah, right. So that's why for one of the many reasons the Amazon is important. Also, many of the plants of the Amazon have, you know, helped people develop really key pharmaceutical medicines, you know, and people believe that the cure to cancer is in the Amazon. Who knows what kind of future maladies we may develop that may have keys in the Amazon rainforest. And we are destroying it way faster than we can ever, you know, really take time to, to discover in partnership with the people of the forest. And those people are the keys to the forest. They are the ones who really have spent, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years working in partnership with that land. And it, the knowledge doesn't, it's not like for sale, you know, you have to really, you have to, people are more conscientious about how they share knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe that touches like a bit on what the significance of it is. And then obviously like, you know, the communities are the guardians of the forest in that way. And, by making the issue of environmental degradation a human rights issue, it actually, for better or worse, puts it more into people's eyes, right? It's much hard, it's, you know, unfortunately, the forest doesn't have a voice. And so indigenous peoples are the voice of the forest. And if we support indigenous mm -hmm. people's voices, we are supporting the forest too. And we are supporting ourselves <laughs> longer term. Um, so that's, that's the stance that Rainforest for, uh, Foundation takes when, when kind of fighting for human rights. Um, yeah. Mm. So what are you, what are you working on, uh, currently? What are you excited about uh, going forward? You know, <laughs> just like, <laughs> you know, that's it. I, to be totally honest with you, I wish I had like a better answer. Um, I think yeah. a lot of it is I'm, I'm going to be continuing to do this work. You know, I'd like to start studying a bit more um, forest monitoring techniques and seeing how different technology in the hands of indigenous people can actually help them preserve their land. So actually by them monitoring their territories as it may have illegal miners or illegal loggers encroaching upon it, they can then submit video footage of it onto a database that, that that can then be used in courts, let's say, that can actually provide a solid basis for preserving those territories. So I'm excited to learn more about that tech. Um, and then, you know, I kind of just still love plants. Like I just want to hang out with more plants. I'm going to be doing a bit more courses in herbalism and kind of studying more the plants of the Northeast where, where I come from in North America and just grounding in in that way because they're just infinitely strange and interesting to me, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, pe people are people are listeners are going to be wondering if we're getting the band back together. <laughs> oh yeah, is there going to be a? I hope so. Yeah, I really or, want to. Yeah. I, yeah. We I'm probably have, gonna we're still got a lot of. We're, we're, I got about. 20 boxes of your books in your basement <laughs> and, better get the band together uh, I have, uh, <laughs> I, I have, that is crazy like i, I have God, a lot like of posters and tracks. blotter paper and and uh i'll need to shave just so i can sell off our merch from when i <laughs> Disagree. I think you could probably put little beads in your. You think I could yeah, just, just yeah, lean we'll in, just draw just little beards. We're not in. the same. Right. Just don't pretend. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, don't pretend things are. Yeah. 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 Um. Anyway, I think I think what you're doing is incredibly important. I'm so happy that you have used uh, all of this time to continue to further what you do, and uh, if, if people want to. Um, learn more about the Amazon Emergency Fund or any other um, organization that yeah. you work with. What do you want 
where do, where do you like to point Where people? do they go? You can go to amazonemergencyfund.org. Um, you can also go to rainforestfoundationus.org, I believe, or maybe it's rainforestfoundation.org. Um, and then you can go on ye old website of mine, which is sophiarockland.com. And I'm frequently, you know, posting vaguely narcissistic and poetic selfies on Instagram if you want to follow me for more kind of contemporary, up-to-date things. No, but really, I like, I post about plants all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you have a great Instagram. I wish you were on it more. Um, it's <laughs> Don't a real say good that. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I, well, actually, you're right. I should take that. I'm, I'm happy for anyone <laughs> that takes <laughs> that distances themselves from from social media so Goodness but gracious. you have great posts thanks um yeah so that's that's everything if people want to check out uh when plants dream um you can get that do you have a, per, a preferred seller or just anywhere that people like getting books just yeah where people like i listen to books. the audio book Great. Yeah. Yeah. You got an audio book. And then we just had our soft cover launch, which is like very rainbow and beautiful. So oh. you can get a copy of that. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So you can put more books in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> Check out When Plants Stream by uh, Daniel Pinchback and Sophia Rockland. Thank you so much for joining me, Sophia. And thanks for having me, Shane. Thank you, listeners, for being, for being such wonderful, curious people. We'll talk with you more next week. <laughs>